I'm a full professor in history and philosophy of science at the Institute of Biology, Federal University of Bahia in Brazil. One of the things that we do in our labs is to work collaboratively with basic education teachers and fishers, fishing communities, artisanal fishing communities. And we are beginning to work with indigenous communities, uh, but we work with fishing communities for 25 years, more or less. Uh, and we have been uh, investigating both uh, their knowledge and how they can be dialoguing with academic scientific knowledge and all the methodological, ethical, political, and epistemological issues that appear to us as we build these, these experiences with them. When I was an undergraduate student in biology, uh, we had a, an anthropologist, uh, Ordepi Serra, who is retired from our university. And he got together this group of biology students and prompted us to work in ethnobiology, which we didn't know what it was at the time. And I then started working on a fishing community in a place called Boipeba in Bahia. And then I was entirely fascinated by how much they know about the animals, about the plants, about the environments. And I was impressed by the fact that despite the common idea that the fishers uh, know patterns in nature, but don't know why the patterns take place. Uh, my first grasp was that they know also how to explain patterns. One of those phenomena was the fact that at some points in the year, more than one in the year, the Stuarini waters are very rich in snooks. Uh, and they basically fish the snooks. They don't fish anything else because it's very rich in snooks. So asking them, well, why? What, what happens in these times of the of, in these times along the year that snook, snooks are so present there? And they gave us a very complex explanation. It was an explanation of several factors. Some of all these factors are interacting. Some factors would facilitate others. Some factors would inhibit others. And there was even uh, different causal paths leading to the same phenomena. So we are, we are expecting they would causally explain the phenomena because causal explanation is kind of a basic thing. Uh, we think in, in, in human cognition. So they would do causal explanation. We are not expecting they would do such a complex explanation. So they told us how when there is rain upstream, then you have all this uh, fresh water coming into the estuary. And then the snooks, they reproduce in the mangroves. They know that. And then they are hiding in the mangroves. So they are difficult to capture. But when the fresh water comes, it, uh, it is time for them to go to the sea. So they go out of the mangroves and go down the river to the mouth of the river under uh, patches of vegetation that goes displaced by, by the rain so that they have protection. Uh, so one reason why there are more snooks is simply that they're moving into the sea. Uh, uh, but then at the same time, the waters are muddy. The waters are muddy because of the rain. And in this estuary, there, there is bioluminescence. So it's a very beautiful. So in some points of the year, when you, when you touch the water, the water shines in green, dean green, but it shines in green. And this bioluminescence, which they say comes from uh, uh, jellyfish. The problem is that these bioluminescence jellyfish, they hit the, the nets, they, put the, they capture the snooks on nets, and the nets sparkles. And then the fishes see the nets and they are smart. They jump over the nets. But when you have muddy waters and the snooks go into the river mouth, they cannot see the bioluminescence because it's very dim light. And so they cannot see in the muddy water. So they get stuck in the nets easier. And they say, that's why we get so many robalo too. It's not only that they're moving towards the river mouth, but they can see the nets. But they say, well, but this might happen also when you have a, a full moon because when you have a full moon, the light of the moon is stronger than the dim bioluminescence. And then in this case, you also have the robalo waters because they cannot see 
the nets and they get into the nets. Uh, at the same time, uh, you have uh, another phenomenon that leads to uh, uh, snooks. I said robalo. Robalo is how snooks are called in Portuguese. <laughs> so another causal process that leads to the snook waters is the time when the, the river, the, the tide is very high, the, the amplitude of the tide, the tide is very broad, and then there is more uh, seawater entering the estuary. And then that's when the adult snooks are coming to go to the mangroves to lay the, their eggs. And then, then they get a lot of snooks too, because they are moving to lay their eggs. Uh, so you have uh, several phenomena intertwined with each other. And they give such a complex cause explanation that we in the paper even argue that we can, and that's a kind of intercultural translation because these are our words. It looks like a mechanistic model. Uh, if you take the definition of a minimal mechanistic model where you have entities and activities organized in such a way that they generate the phenomena, uh, that's what they're talking about. They don't call mechanism because it doesn't matter to them how to call this as a mechanism or not, but uh, from our from a dialogue with our academic perspective, this is what we would, we would, we would call an explanation like that. Uh, so I like this example because it shows the, 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 the amount of knowledge they have. So uh, once we asked a, fisher, a fisherman uh, about a particular kind of crab, uh, so how could we know that this crab was with a soft shell? And it was not a crab he, he captured, so he didn't know. But then he told us, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do some research, then I'll tell you. And then some days later, he came back and said, well, I know exactly how it is. And they brought us to the mangroves and showed that that's the soft shell crab you were asking about. And that's how it looks like when they are trying to dig in the mud but the shell is soft. And we asked him, um, but how, 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 how did you investigate that? And he said, well, I captured 10 of these crabs and I put them there, some were hard shell, some were soft shell, and then I compared the tracks in the mud. Then I, I know how now, how, how it looks like. I didn't know, but now I know. So they can even produce new knowledge when they need. So I think of indigenous local or, or a peasant knowledge as specific kinds of systems of knowledge. And I try to differentiate them because I use indigenous knowledge only for the originary people who lived in the places that were colonized, like Amerindian indigenous peoples. Then we have a peasant knowledge. Uh, this peasant knowledge is a kind of a knowledge developed after colonization when you have people who start doing farming or fishing in specific conditions, but they are, they are not exactly uh, stewards of these original knowledge. So for instance, the fishers in Brazil, the, the, the culture they have now for five centuries is not the originary uh, indigenous knowledge from Brazil, it's a hybrid, a cultural hybrid from the Portuguese knowledge because Portuguese are fishing people too. So it's a hybrid of the fishing knowledge of the Portuguese and the different indigenous groups that the Portuguese met on the coast of Brazil. Usually it is peasant knowledge or indigenous knowledge, but there may be some cases where we have uh, some local knowledge that we cannot classify as, as peasant or indigenous. And I think this is important. I try to avoid the, the expression traditional knowledge, uh, even though it is in the legislation as something that gives rights to traditional people. So leaders of what are called traditional communities you usually don't like this argument because they have rights guaranteed by this disqualification. But, for, but traditional, it was a part of the colonization process, opposing tradition to development, for instance. So I try to avoid these. I try to avoid ethnobiology, even though I publish in ethnobiology journals. That's how the field's called. But I think when you say biology, but ethno in front, you are implicitly saying, it's, it's not as good as the academic biology. Uh, so I say different kinds of biology or different, not different kinds of biology. Bio, biology is also Western concept, different kinds of knowledge about living beings. So to have a true conversation, I have to take them seriously. 
So I think academics don't take many people seriously. Uh, and I think that's also related to the fact that uh, academic, academic science has been distrusted by a number of people because people want to be taken seriously. Uh, so let's say many people are hesitant against the vaccine. They are not anti-vaxxers and denialists. They just have worries. They want the worst to be taken seriously. And sometimes the academic science don't take other people seriously. So I think that's something that they can teach us. When we start taking them seriously, you can learn about the relation of humility. But there is no reason in looking at this as validation of the fishing knowledge. They don't need our validation. They have the knowledge. They fish with their knowledge. They know what they're doing. So uh, we don't need to take a position validating their knowledge. But it's more about asking, looking for a space for dialogue. Another important thing is that uh, we should move gradually from working about them to work with them. This paper about explanation, for instance, uh, uh, most of the fishers there have their names there. So it's their knowledge. We are just reporting that the knowledge is theirs. Uh, from there, we, can, we should move towards making them authors of papers with us. I don't know if I say this correctly, but make symmetrical uh, the relationships. And finally, we need to give a return to the communities. And the return shouldn't be something like, I give, your, your, uh, give you your, my paper, I give you my fees, because that's pointless to them. They have nothing to do with our papers and our fees, but we should look for a truly valuable return to the community. So this means uh, we need to find uh, spaces and uh, questions and issues where we can work with them. Uh, so for instance, uh, we found this space in the village we work in the schools, where we are working for six years with the teachers. And the basic idea is that we should bring fishing knowledge into the school in dialogue with school knowledge. We should bring the fishermen and fisherwomen into the school to teach their children and their, their, their granddaughters and grand all, all their relatives uh, with their knowledge. And we are continuously working with the teacher in building educational innovations, educational materials that bring this knowledge into school. But we are also getting into uh, working with the communities towards solving key problems for them. For instance, these communities are continually dispossessed of their territories by tourism, by uh, new people coming to their villages, gentrification, by conservation efforts that take part of their territories out of the hands. And we are starting to try to build up more leadership among them, inviting leaders from other fishing communities who are already more organized uh, to try to help. That's a more dangerous territory because in schools, things are more peaceful. But when you go to a village and you start to empower part of the people, you are getting into trouble because there are conflicts within the village themselves and you are in the middle of the conflict. But but, uh, but unless we build this kind of uh, relationships of trust and collaboration, we are not really taking them seriously. We're not really, mm, really matter, uh, worried and concerned about what's going on with there. So we get to get there. It's difficult, but we have to get there. So I think there's all these efforts in making the relationships more symmetrical. Otherwise, is extractive research, is knowledge mining, yeah, we will do this. We'll publish papers and have their knowledge there because that's what, what we do. That, that's part of our work. So if I went there with uh, funding from research, I said, well, I'll not publish any paper because, you know, I cannot extract research from them. There, I, I would be in trouble. So I'll need to publish papers, but then I need to give something back. And this can be, and this should be uh, uh, important for them. I'm very lucky because I work with ecologists. Most of them are very fond of these issues because they are all into connecting with society. Most, not, not they all, but most of them are trying to work with other stakeholders, either politicians, environmental technicians, schools, uh, ag 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 agriculture, farming communities. And so all these ideas have an echo in the place where I work. 
there are debates, obviously, there are always debates, but uh, they are, I think, uh, well received. Well, uh, in the science education research community, where I, I also work very deeply, uh, I, I think they are well received, even by people who disagree with me. Uh, because I, I think that the, the fact that I avoid in my work consciously some of the pitfalls that sometimes people who work in their culturality fall into like relativism. So I'm completely against relativism. So I'm always very careful in carving up the distinctions and not trying to overgeneralize uh, claims. And I think this helps. But despite that, some people simply think uh, all these things are crazy. Well, part of then I read talked about is be uh, fond of relational humility. Uh, that, that's, I think it is important to avoid at all costs epistemic injustice. Uh, and I think when you are, you are assuming relational humility, uh, you are in a good way to avoid epistemic injustice. Uh, and then uh, build uh, meaningful relationships with the people from the communities. And that, that's a hard thing because you can go, come and go. You'll be trustful relationships. We work with two fishing communities. Now we're beginning to work with one indigenous village. And I don't know what, what else we could work because these are relationships for life. Uh, so we get true connections there. Uh, we had a trouble, for instance, explaining why some students come and go because they don't know what is the academic word. So they were asking, oh, well, what is this guy who was here? And I thought, well, no, he was he's Colombian. He went back to his country. He finished his PhD students. We should need to be very careful with these personal relations. And uh, sometimes academic scientists are not careful with the relations they build with these communities. But, uh, but we should be very, very uh, concerned about that. Uh, another thing I think is important is to assume that things will go wrong you have a lot of doubts and you have a lot of uncertainty in it. In some points, you don't know what to do because it is so difficult. Uh, as I tell my students, sometimes uh, I go to bed in the fishing villages in the place where we sleep there. And I put my, my head in the pillow and I say, well, why I didn't stay doing philosophy it was so much simpler because human beings are very complex. Human relations are very complex. So things will not go the way we want. Uh, you will never find the golden participation you want. Uh, it's not true that you build symmetrical relations. You strive for, but they will not be symmetrical. And you should be uh, ready for that. So uh, I can give an example. I, uh, in the, we build with these teachers, I was telling about this community of press. And that's, I was actively participating. It was very, very, very pleasant and rewarding. But at some point I said, well, I cannot, I need to leave. Because you know, I cannot leave my skin. They are women, I'm a man. I can do anything about it. Uh, I'm white, I can do anything about it. I'm the coordinator of the project. This comes with a, a heavy weight. I'm a full professor of the university. Then uh, I was silencing people. Even though I was trying to make symmetrical relations, I couldn't, it was impossible. So I had to say to my students, you know, I leave. When you need me to be there, there is some conflict or something that you need me, then you, 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 you ask me to be, but I'll not be because you know, they talk a lot more when I'm not there. I know, I have the recordings of the meetings, I know, so I can be there. So we need to accept this kind of frustration, hesitancy, we'll do things wrong, we regret things wrong. And I think we in academ academics, uh, particularly young academics, they want to be foolproof, the things never go wrong. Uh, so we have to be prepared, the things will go wrong, sometimes they'll go badly wrong, and we need to handle it. We need to handle it. Otherwise, we we'll keep in our armchair doing armchair analysis because the real world is very messy. It's very messy and things are very complicated. <laughs>